Why do they want to create a panic to make these banks collapse? Because these banks are under their control. They're the ones that called in the loans. Therefore, they wanted a central bank. They wanted one place to control the money and the wealth of this nation and its people as well. And they couldn't get it. So they created these panics. Listen to this. A representative of the Rothschild interests, J.P. Morgan, was preparing for the next scheduled event in the creation of America's central bank. During the early months of 1907, Morgan was in Europe for five months, shuttling back and forth between London and Paris, the homes of the two branches of the Rothschild banking family. The reason Morgan was in Europe was a decision was being made to have Morgan participate a, or precipitate a bank panic in America. When he returned, he started rumors that the Knickerbocker Bank in New York was insolvent. The bank's depositors became frightened because they thought that Morgan, being the best known banker of the day, might very well be right. Their panic started a run on the bank. Morgan was right. And the panic at Knickerbocker also caused runs on other banks, and the panic of 1907 was complete. The propaganda started almost immediately that the state chartered bankers could not be trusted anymore with the banking affairs of the nation. The need for a central bank became apparent by the panic of 1907, or at least this is how the conspiracy argued. Historian Frederick Lewis Allen, writing in Life magazine, became aware of the plot. He wrote, certain chroniclers have arrived at the ingenious conclusion that the Morgan interests took advantage of the unsettled conditions during the autumn of 1907 to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed so that it would kill off rival banks and consolidate the pre eminence of the banks within the J.P. Morgan orbit. Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton University in 1907, spoke to the American people attempting to remove whatever blame might be placed upon the Morgan shoulders. He said, all this trouble could be averted. Now listen to this. All this trouble could be averted if we would appoint a committee or, of six or seven public-spirited minds like J.P. Morgan to handle the affairs of the money of our nation. So Wilson wanted to hand over the affairs of the nation to the very person who had caused the panic in the first place, J.P. Morgan and six or seven of his associates. Are you learning anything? Okay, I, 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 let me hurry. The individual bankers, the solution, of course, a central bank. The individual the bankers used to introduce the legislation that created the central bank was a senator from Rhode Island and maternal grandfather of the Rockefeller brothers, David Nelson et al., by the name of Nelson Aldrich. He was appointed to a National Monetary Committee and charged to make a thorough study of the financial practices before formulating bank and current and, and reform legislation. For two years, the commission toured the banking houses of Europe, learning the secrets of central banking system in Europe. Upon Aldrich's return in November of 1910, he boarded a train to Hoboken, New Jersey, for a ride to Jekyll Island, Georgia. His destination was the Jekyll Island Hunt Club, which was owned by J.P. Morgan. It was here that the legislation that would give America its central bank was written. Aboard the train with Senator Aldrich, and later joining them in Georgia, were A. Pyatt Andrew, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Senator Nelson Aldrich, the National Monetary Commission, Frank Vanderlip, President of Kuhn and Loeb's National City Bank of New York, Henry Davidson Sr., partner of the J.P. Morgan, Charles Norton, President of J.P. Morgan's First National Bank of New York, Paul Arberg, partner in the banking house of Kuhn, Loeb and & Company, and Benjamin Strong, President of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. The railroad car that these gentlemen traveled belonged to Senator Ulrich, and while they were aboard, they were sworn to secrecy and asked to refer to each other by first names only. On one, of the first, one of those, Mr. Vanderlip, later went on to reveal his role in writing the bill that created the Federal Reserve System. He wrote in the Saturday Evening Post, In 1910, I was as a secretive, indeed, as, as secretive as any conspirator. 
I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together in the night departure. We were instructed to come one at a time un unobtrusively as possible to the terminal of the New Jersey literal on the Hudson where Senator Aldrich's private car would be in readiness attached to the rear end of the train for the south. Once aboard the private car we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. Discovery we knew simply must not happen or else all the time and effort would be wasted. Notice that the conspirators did not want the American people to know what they had in store for them. A central bank. The legislation was to to be written not by a group of legislators, but a group of bankers, mostly connected with the man responsible for 1907's panic, J.P. Morgan. The conspiracy also had one additional problem. They had to avoid the name Central Bank. And for that reason, they had come up with the designation of the Federal Reserve System. It would be owned by private individuals who would draw profit from the ownership of shares and who would control the nation's issuance of money. It would have as its command the nation's entire financial resources and it would be able to mobilize and mortgage the United States by involving the United States in major wars. The method the conspirators used to defraud the American people was to divide the Federal Reserve System into 12 districts so that the American people could not call the bank a central bank. The fact that the 12 districts had one d director called the Federal Reserve Chairman, apparently was not to be considered relevant. The one non-banker at Jekyll Island was Senator Nelson Aldrich, but he certainly could have qualified as a wealthy man, capable of starting his own bank. When he entered the Senate in 1881, he was worth $50,000. When he left in 1911, he was worth $30 million. Now that the legislation creating the central bank was written, it would need a president who would not veto the bill after it passed the House and Senate. The president in 1910 and 11, you ought to know him in Ohio, was William Howard Taft, a Republican elected in 1908. And he was on record as saying he would veto a bill that would come to his desk concerning a central bank. He was a Republican and was surely to be erected, elected to a second term in 1912. So William Howard Taft was the president, but he wouldn't go along with the scheme. So in the Republican primary, Teddy Roosevelt, anybody remember him? Teddy Roosevelt ran against Taft in the Republican primary. He was backed by this group of bankers, but he lost in the Republican primary. Listen to this. So they decided they'd have to do something about the regular election. So what did they do? They went and got Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, to enter the presidential race against Taft, a Republican, so that the Democratic candidate, Woodrow Wilson, who had pledged he would sign the bill, the Republicans would divide their vote and therefore Woodrow Wilson would be elected with less than a majority vote. Couldn't beat Taft on his own so then they financed Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, to run two Republicans in the presidential election, dividing the Republican vote. It's not about Republican or Democrat. I'm simply telling you how these people are able to manipulate the system. So their millions back a candidate, knowing that he's not going to be elected, so that their man can get elected because he will pass the legislation to the central bank. He was elected by less than a majority vote, and the Federal Reserve System came into being. Hello? Watch this. Here's how it works. They print it, we borrow it, and we pay them interest. This is a private company, privately held. They cannot get, they have to pay for postage stamps. They are that far away from the federal government. This is an independent corporation and group of bankers. So when you hear the news say, the Fed, 
decided that the interest rate will go up. How do, how do they get to decide? They get to decide because in 1913, Woodrow Wilson, he was elected, he was a